so this is going to be a panel discussion on colorism. Uh, again, my name is Dion Michelle Daniel. I'm a playwright and an actress. And uh, I would love uh, for all of you to introduce yourselves and also maybe talk about the first time, uh, you know, the conversation came into, you know, your circle. So for me, for instance, uh, I remember when I was a little kid, um, my mother, we're from North Carolina, and, uh, my, and South Carolina, North Carolina, my mother had lost all of her photos um, due to a hurricane. Um, and it was, I don't remember which one it was, but she lost all of her photos, so there's only one photo of her um, as a child. And I remember the, in the photo, because it was black and white, she looked much darker than she was. And so in my head, I thought that if you went outside and stayed in the sun, you'd get lighter. Um, and so I remember I would go outside and just like be in my little tank top and my shorts and go out in the sun and my mom was like, what are you doing? Why are you going outside? I was like, oh, I'm trying to get lighter like you. Because I saw like the photo from when she was, you know, perceivably more dark and what she is now. So that's kind of like my first intro to that. And I was like, what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. Hi, um, my name is Alicia Wise. I'm a uh, writer, poet, and teaching artist. And um, I guess my first introduction, I'm from Camden, New Jersey. And uh, I, at first my mother made me go to a, uh, a Catholic school. She didn't want me to go to school in the hood at first. So um, I went to like the school right outside the hood. And I remember like, even if they had a problem with my skin, none of the white kids, it was a majority white school, they didn't really tease me. I could see the looks, but one day this guy, this guy, this kid um, who was darker than me um, got transferred to the school and unfortunately he ended up being a bad kid. It was just such a terrible stereotype, but he was a bad kid and he always teased me. And that was the first time that I had someone ever tease me for my skin complexion. I was about um, probably like 10 years old and it was just wild. I was like, and I don't know if I was just like a woke baby or what it is, but <laughs> something in my head was like, this ain't right. Like, ain't nobody here, none of these white kids got anything to say about my skin, but this person who's darker than me keeps teasing me about my skin. I remember one day he, he, he made a joke about it and everybody started like chuckling or being afraid to chuckle, but they were looking and I was like, well, you know what, you darker than me. And I felt so good and he just looked stupid. He didn't know what to say. So that was my first intro. I've never had a problem with being dark skin. I've always had a problem with how other people saw my skin, even from a very young age. Hi, I'm Danny Williams-Germs. Um, I study race, gender, and inequality at UCLA. Um, race for me became really obvious when I was in the middle school. So I'm originally from the East Coast, Northern Virginia, and my mom used to pick me up in the carpool lane, and one day she did, um, and then the next day I went to school, and everyone was like, who is that white woman who picked you up in the carpool lane? And I was like, there wasn't any white woman, there was just my mom. But my mom is very, very fair. Um, but I never thought about her as being anything other than her. And it was the first time that I became really, really, um, it became obvious that race and color, shades, phenotype, was really important in this um, small town outside of Washington, D.C., Reston. And I was like, oh, okay. But she's still, in my mind, she's my mom, and she's just African-American or black. But to them, because of her phenotype, they assigned her whiteness. And I was like, that's really, really weird. Because, you know, blackness is a spectrum. And um, even within my own family, it's very much a spectrum. And then I started to think about it. And I was like, oh, when I was little, it's like, don't go outside. I got the opposite. Like, don't go outside. Um, stay out of the sun. Um, my Nana and paper brown bags, you know, like you can't get darker than the bag. And I was like, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, around 12 is when I, I figured it out that it was a deal. Hey everybody, my name is Daisy October. 
and I'm a priestess in the tradition of Hudu, which is an African spiritual tradition created and maintained by African people who are brought to specifically the United States. Um, my first intro to colorism, I have so many stories in my teenage years, but my first intro to colorism when I was about four years old, I was sitting next to my aunt, who is this gorgeous, super chocolate skin lady, um, and we're looking through old family photos. So, you know, we're passing through pictures, looking at pages, and we turn to a page where my great grandmother is, her father's mother. And um, she's like, oh, there's, your, there's Nana. You know, she's, she's, she's mixed with white. She always had really good hair. And, you know, she, she was well loved, and she, she, but she kept it really, really sweet. And, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess Nana does look a little bit different than a lot of us. And we're passing through the pages, and she turns to a page, and for some reason she's like, oh, oh, no, turn the page. Jane, Jane, I'm, I'm like, what's going on? So I look down and I see it's a picture of her and my mother, um, their sisters, and when they were about four years old, tiny, tiny little babies. I'm like, what's wrong? That's cute. You know, you're a cute little baby. She was like, no, I look like a little black dot, a little black dot, change it, you know, turn it on. And that was my first time understanding that or seeing the minim minimalizing of darkness and the demonizing of darkness. Her calling herself as a baby, a little black dot, you know, and that's the voice she used it in. And um, it kind of set the tone for everything I had to learn living in Los Angeles and, you know, being in the Hollywood environment. So it was, it was pretty traumatic, and, and, but it set the tone. Hi everyone, my name is Amethyst, and um, I started an African-centered school supplies and stories brand called Kids of the Cosmos, and we feature African children that represent the mother continent and the diaspora. And it's something that's really personal to me that my family and I started, my, my parents, my brother, and I, and I would say one of the reasons is because, that's so personal, is because of my childhood growing up in Orange County. I grew up in Anaheim and I grew up in Orange. I can't remember one particular defining moment, but I remember being four and five years old and playing with Barbies. And we know that Barbie has blonde hair, blue eyes, and my mom would buy me black Barbies, black dolls, and I would play with them. But if, for instance, let's say the roller skating Barbie came out, like I wanted the white Barbie with the blonde hair, right? Because she's the one that comes with the accessories. She's the one that's shining bright in the commercials. They made her the star, right? So that's what I wanted because that's what I thought was pretty. That's what I thought was appealing because that's what entertainment and movies and um, pretty much like school everyone had taught me, right? Even though I had my family who told me the brown skin is beautiful, my hair is beautiful, like it, it, was, it was hard for that to seep in with me because entertainment, what's cool, told me something, something different, right? Um, so I would say just that in general was like a defining moment um, into not fully understanding colorism at that time, but still being aware that, you know, me as a black child, girl, was different than everybody else in um, the community that I was raised in in Orange County. Well, I think you all heard my story. That, <laughs> and that moment when I was four years old really was the first moment that I recognized my own skin and beauty. And it was such a pure, innocent moment where I was playing, I was in the backyard, I was by myself. And it was like me and the sun having a conversation. And literally, my skin was glistening. I was like, wow, this is so cool. This is amazing. And literally when I started school, it's like all of that got shut down. I did not recognize my own beauty. 
I was essentially tormented by people at school every day. Someone had something to say about my skin color. So I love how you brought up um, demonizing blackness and like what it means to be white adjacent, white passing, and how that's right and black is wrong. Can, does anybody want to speak to kind of, just for anyone who doesn't know, the kind of like history of colorism and how it really affects the black community? Because again, as you said, leaving New Orleans, you really didn't have a problem. And for me, it was like, coming out of the South, starting school in California, um, was the first time that I also as well felt beautiful. Um, and even from going from a high school that was predominantly black, I was always kind of called like, oh, the darkie. I got compared to Feely, because um, I was going through my natural hair phase too, and I was like, mm, let me wear my twist. And then it was like going to a predominantly white school in California where like, it was like, ooh, your skin is so beautiful. And it was all around all these white folks. So it was like, wait, this is making me feel really weird. Um, and does anybody just want to talk about that history and why it affects the black community so much? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we could take a look at, let's say, Willie Lynch, right? Because we know that Willie Lynch had uh, taught white America to turn black people against one another, right? Um, to turn dark skin against light skin and mixed, and we've had all these different names. Even when you look at Latin America, right? There's not just um, black, white, mulatto. There's many different breakdowns within the race, right, of what it is to be black or a person of color. Uh, so I think that has had a pretty like impeccable negative um, effect left on us. I think, you know, the history of chattel slavery here in America and the Southern Nation and um, forced rape and, you know, producing children who are of, um, who are biracial or mixed race or mulatto and blood quantums and, you know, as you mentioned, Shana, you know, octroons, quadrons and this wanting to be in proximity to whiteness and whiteness being deemed as the penultimate, you know, of the hierarchy and blackness is subjugated to the bottom rung and any ability to get close to whiteness garners you some form of social capital here in the United States. Um, and so in order for you to access the privileges that go along with white supremacy, um, Dr. Cheryl Harris at UCLA Law says whiteness is property. It's a form of capital that can be traded upon and cashed in. And so when you have access via a phenotype that is more characteristically defined as white or white adjacent as opposed to black, then you are in this middle ground of the racialized hierarchy that we've established here. And in order to like kind of solidify your stronghold on a rung above blackness, it requires that you denigrate blackness and that you um, participate in a racialized social violence against blackness in order for you to um, exemplify your belongingness to whiteness. And so within the black community, you know, skin and phenotype and, and hair texture has been fetishized, you know, and it is good hair versus bad hair. And, you know, as you mentioned, like in my family, it's like red bone, you know, um, and high yellow. Um, I don't have much to add, just said so much. Um, I guess the only thing I can add that, that makes me think of is just as being a teaching artist or working in classrooms a lot, like I'm thinking about myself when I was young, if, um, 
if I knew so much of the history of colorism and everything like that I know, if I knew that then, um, I would have probably, as I said before, I didn't really have ever have a problem being a dark skin, but I knew I would have probably dealt with it a, a little bit easier. So now when I'm in the classrooms with a lot of my youth um, and I see them like still getting on each other, calling each other blackie and all this stuff, or I just like, it's, it's something really awesome that happens the moment you start to talk to them about like this history. And I'm like, I wish this was something I was taught in the classrooms more. I wish a lot of stuff was taught in the classrooms, but I really <laughs> wish this was taught in the classrooms more because like it starts with the young people, um, especially now. And when you start to show them the history of like why they like get on each other and because this causes fights, this causes kids to get jumped after school, it causes so much, it's ridiculous. Um, you see them start to love themselves more and start to be like, oh, you bright in this, you know, and like really embrace each other more. So I just wish it's something that, um, yeah, people would find a way to put into education and put into their classrooms. Um, moving on to my next kind of question was this show, this play really follows your journey of self-healing and self-love. And I kind of want to open up like what should black women specifically, but black people, how, like, how do we tackle this? Um, because it is still prevalent today. We still see the hashtags a few years ago, light skin, dark skin, you know, it's, it's still a thing. So what are maybe your own tips for self-care, self-love, loving yourself that you would want to pass on? And even going into um, your practice, like, is there some things in that that you'd want to impart? The society you live in is feeding you images of beauty if you're a dark skinned person that don't look like you. So you need to understand that from jump. You know, next new model that's coming out, next new artist that they want you to pay attention to, more than likely, um, there's the, the selling point for this artist or person is that they have this mixed look or complexion. Um, so immediately, comparing yourself to what is out there and what is deemed as beautiful is not comparing yourself as an act of self-care. Um, you know, you see these ads of people who don't look like you outside, all right, inside of your home, make sure there are people that look like you hanging on the walls. Um, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, who's kind of an, an innovative uh, teacher on, on racism and why racism happens, which people don't tend to ask, um, she suggests putting images of what she calls crystal black people up on your walls, meaning very, very dark skin toned individuals as art on your walls. So when you're walking around your home and subconsciously digesting the imagery in your house, in your space, you are reintegrating those images into your consciousness as okay, as comfortable, as home, you know, feelings of home and comfort. Um, that's another thing that can be done. I've been wearing my natural hair and it's been so liberating, especially when you think about it, because we put so much money into weaves and perms and getting our hair done and straightening and damaging and everything. Like, it's so, it, it's a really good feeling to know that you're now being accepted for embracing like the inner natural and just out your outer beauty as well. Um, and it's funny because even back home in Orange County, I, I, I strongly believe in reading a lot. I read up on my history, read up on my, my people, especially the history of black women um, from ancient history to now because like the more I just am reminded um, or just being around people who talk about those things, not all the time, sometimes I'm like, I just want to watch How to Get Away from Murder. But, <laughs> um, but as, as much as I can, to just read up on my history, because that, that, it's empowering to, to just remember where you come from and then to pass that knowledge on. Um, and then the more I empower myself to, uh, on the good days, to be able to just walk with my head as high as I'm able to. And I like, I love setting an example around like, younger uh, black women um, or black girls when, you know, you see a little black girl somewhere in a mall or whatever, a restaurant, and you just look in, and I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, you know, see, sis. Um, <laughs> and that's just a great feeling. So I love being an example. I love uh, reading up on my, my, my people, and um, I love creating spaces for black women, black people in general, but definitely black women. I love uh, being able to bring us together. I'm, I'm very, very introverted. I'm very shy. I don't like people most days, but in, in theory, in my spirit, 
I love people and I definitely love uh, black people and, and, and black women and I, in my heart, I want us to really, you know, be together and um, to create those spaces or just in my art, in my writing, I'm always, always pushing black women to the top. Whenever I see a like little black girl, I remember I, I worked at McDonald's for a second when I was in high school, and whenever there'd be like a little black girl with little puffs, I'd be like, I love your hair, and I just had to let her, you know, because when you were a child, that is when you're forming, you know, your self worth, your self image, and I remember as a child, for me, my aunt, whenever I go over to her house, she keeps saying to me, When is your mom going to perm your hair? When is she going to do that? When she needs to do that? So by the time, my mom was like, no. Like, you can't get a perm until you're 16. And I remember by the time I was like 10, 11, that's when I started getting a hot comb taken to my hair. And by the time I was 13, all my hair fell out because I was frying it. And at that point, I was like, I don't want a perm. I just, I'm just going to go natural. And that started a whole phase. But it's like what you said with hair and I think it's also not even like disowning, you know, the perms or the weaves, but just knowing that you have a choice and knowing that like I don't have to have straight hair because for so long I felt like I had to have straight hair and I would do anything it took to have that straight hair. <laughs> so with this newer uh, challenges for me personally is doing the work that I can, meaning not taking up too much of the burden and not allowing myself to be um, relegated to a position of domesticity or mewling for the movement. Um, there's a great deal of work to be done. As one individual black woman, we cannot do it. Um, it is a collective initiative. As we grow and learn and become more conscious, more woke, um, as my Nana would say, when we study to show ourselves approved, then we can move together. Um, I love the internet. I love the its ability to bring us all together, to engage in communal dialogue, to understand that the diaspora is just that. You know, it is so huge. We all have our own respective, individualized lived experiences. One is not greater or lesser than the next. It just is. Um, even as I sit along this panel, we are all black women, but our lived experience that brought us here to this space is very different. Um, and being in this position, it's not a hierarchy. You know, like, I am so humbled and honored to be here. I'm so humbled and honored to have witnessed your work, your art, Gina. Um, thank you. That was a level of vulnerability um, that is lacking, you know? To tell the truth about what it means to be a black woman in America. It is painful um, to conjure the spirit and courage to do that but to also to sit in communion and bear witness is also very difficult. Um, because we as Americans don't necessarily like the truth. Hmm. You know, we like the mythologized version of America. We don't like the truth of America. I acknowledge you, I see you, I love you. You are amazing to me. And we're all brown girls on this panel. Thank you. Just thank you. Just really thank you.
So uh, that's going to conclude our talk back for the day. And I just want to also say thank you to Shayna um, for bringing us.